now yeah now it's recording so hello peep thank you so much for being today with us at low carbon city we are very very excited to having you and present us your your job your playbook and talk about climate action in general so i'm going to start introducing peep peep uh, she describes herself as a climate problem solver, systems thinker, and connector. She works, she works as a planet and climate advisor, advisor at Ashoka, a network addressing the world's most pressing problem. And also, she is a visiting fellow for the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship. She has worked in social entrepreneurship, local governments, academia, and philanthropy philanthropy across South Africa, the UK, and New Zealand. Pip is an award-winning social entrepreneur for founding Enkem, Make Your Mark, a youth leadership organization in South Africa that has impacted tens of thousands of young people across the country. So thank you, Pip, for being uh, this afternoon with us. And yeah, just tell you, tell us more about your job, if you have a presentation about what you are doing in Ashoka and about your uh, climate playbook. Brilliant. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a such a delight to be able to, to talk to you and to talk to your network. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll share a little bit about the work that we've been doing at Ashoka um, and the and the, the research that we did in partnership with the Skull Center at uh, at Oxford University side business school. I'll just uh, I'll bring up some slides because that might be a useful way to do this. Great, awesome. Right, let's see if this works. <laughs> this is the part that you will edit out. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and we are. Is there we go. <clears throat> is black. I don't know why. <laughs> okay, tell me when it comes up with the picture. Nothing? No, it's black. Okay, all right. So it's... we can cut this. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to bore your your listeners with uh yeah, don't worry. With this, it's a nice thing that we are recording it. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, okay. All right. And now we will hopefully have more luck the second time around. Okay. Let me know when you can see that. Yeah. Now we can see your presentation. Brilliant. Um. So. For a little bit of context, Ashoka's vision is everyone a change maker. And when it comes to the topic of climate change or planet and climate, to recognise that climate change is sort of only one of an interconnected suite of ecological challenges that, that we're facing around the world at the moment, um, this vision of, of everyone a change maker is, is really at the heart of what we think is needed. Um, and so we, we started to explore this idea of what it takes to have everyone everywhere all at once working towards better outcomes for the ecological crisis. The starting point is really this question, you know, why isn't change happening at the speed and scale that science tells us is needed? You know, we know that more people care than ever before. Um, we have more solutions than ever before. You know, the number of solutions that are coming into the market is increasing every day. Um, and we also know the stakes better than ever before. You know, the science is improving. We, we understand more about the impacts and um, a, we have a better sense of the, the probable timelines for the impacts of climate change than we've ever had before. And yet, and yet, change still isn't happening at the speed and scale required. So what's happening? Um, and, and one of the things that we see is that there's this pervasive sense of disempowerment. Um, and, so, and so the thing that, that we at Ashoka started working on is, is how do we increase, um, how do we build people's sense of, of agency 
the, the climate agency. Um, and I think it's important to note that when we talk about climate change, you know, we're talking about so many different things. We're talking about food, we're talking about housing, cities, obviously. Um, we're also talking about jobs, we're talking about racial justice, gender justice, we're talking about health. You know, it's not one field per se, it's a lens by which we can understand every single aspect of our societies and lives. You know, the US military of all groups talks about climate change um, as a threat multiplier. Um, I think of it as being a mirror that shows us the interconnectedness of, of our world. Um, and so if we look at where we've come over the decades that we've known about, about climate change. You know, science, scientists and environmentalists have been trying to get the message across for my whole life. Um, and the good news is that, that people are, are now aware and they now care. Um, you know, this was just a, 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 a quick scan of what are the different um, uh, headlines and, and front pages of newspapers that have been um, in relatively recent media and uh, you know we, we're getting the, the message across but the the challenge is that um this increasing level of alarm that's 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 growing around the world isn't translating into um isn't translating into action and and what we see is that for many people this these increasing levels of alarm are actually triggering um this this increasing sense of disempowerment you know it's, it's triggering our, our psychological defense mechanisms because quite frankly this it is a, an alarming thing to be considering um, and what that does it means that people switch off and it ultimately has a negative correlation with agency i love this quote because i think it i think it captures part of the problem you know, at exactly the time when it's become clear that global warming is in every sense a collective predicament, humanity finds itself in the thrall of a dominant culture in which the idea of the collective has been exiled from politics, economics, and literature alike. Um, by Amitav Ghosh. You know, the, the majority of, of advice that we see about climate change and, and how to address it, it focuses on the individual. You know, it focuses on consumer decisions, focuses on lifestyle choices, you know, the, the little actions that you can take that can make a big difference. Um, and while we're also seeing bigger messages about, you know, turning up to vote or turning up to protest, um, and those are a step in the right direction. And, and I'm not saying that, that little actions don't matter. Um, when we were looking at this at Ashoka, we, we were really grappling with the idea of how do we get that sense of a larger, um, a larger whole. How do we get to? How do we activate people to think in this, in this, at this level of the systemic and and of the collective? Um, and so we we went looking for places where there were there was work being done that was being effective in in activating people, not just for single actions, not just for the little things but activating people as complex, um, as playing multiple roles across the different parts of their, their life, their days, their weeks, their months, um, tapping into people's hearts as well as their heads, um, and acting people as citizens, as employees, as investors, as relational beings, as members of families, um, and empowering people to be change makers. And so we came to this with this question, of, of how do we how do we increase people's agency um, and when we have a question like that we we look to Ashoka's incredible community of um, planet and climate innovators the Ashoka fellows a community of uh, 600 more than 600 now actually social entrepreneurs around the world just working on on um, on, on the ecological crisis um, and this is just a, a snapshot of a few around the world who, who are working in this space. But we we ended up doing a number of different research projects simultaneously. So we did we sent out a survey to um, uh, all of the Ashoka Fellows, so not just these 600. 
Um, we uh, did a mapping of, of all of all of the people working on this topic, and then we did a series of deep dive interviews. And we were really looking like from the ground up, what are we seeing that works? And the result was the Climate Change Maker Playbook. Um, we launched it last month. It's got a forward by uh, Christiana Figueres, the former executive secretary of the UNFCCC. Um, you know, she's often known as the, the architect of the Paris Agreement. Um, and it's done in partnership with the Skoll Centre for Social Entrepreneurship at Oxford University's Site Business School. And so while it's got this, this ground up, um, you know, what are we seeing that works, it's, it also comes with a, sort of a level of uh, academic rigour and, and strong theoretical foundations that, um, that comes with, with working with a, an institution like the Skoll Centre and uh, the brilliant team there. Um, but the, the idea was uh, what, you know, what are the how to's, what are the lessons that we can learn? What are the strategies that we see from the incredible social entrepreneurs around the world who are actually doing this, who are actually activating people to be climate change makers? And the idea was that if we pulled together these lessons from a diverse enough group of of social entrepreneurs, diverse um, in terms of the geography that they were working in, um, in terms of the types of people that they were working to activate. So we, we looked at um, social entrepreneurs who were working with uh, small fishing communities in uh, Asia and Africa. We were, looked at people who were looking at um, illegal logging in um, uh, in lots of different places around the world. We looked at people working um, with regenerative farming in, in the US um, uh, and with Fortune 500 companies. You know, there were, it, was, it was so many different types of audiences and we did see commonalities in what they were doing. And so what we put together was this, um, was this, this guide essentially on what it takes to, to activate people to drive change proactively. And so we found three strategies and those are the, the big boxes around the three big boxes around the edge. So the first one is making it personal. The second is gathering support. And the third is creating enabling conditions. Um, and for each of these, we identified three tactics that we saw the, the, the social entrepreneurs that we spoke to, the Ashoka Fellows, using again and again. There are other ways of doing this as well, but of achieving these, these three strategies. But these were the ones that we saw showing up again and again. And so if we just go a little bit deeper into this, um, so the first strategy, I think about it that as, as being about the individual person, about um, building their internal motivation, building their, their agency and self-efficacy. And to do that, it's really important to tap into things that people care about. So making it personal is about tying climate action to the specific context of a person's role or geography or their interests, the things that they love, um, and communicating the complexities and possibilities in a way that deeply resonates. Um, you know, climate change is my day job, and uh, I even find it sometimes overwhelming, and I feel like I'm too small. And so we really we see the need to um, to tap into people's love, their care, um, and to help them see the the way that climate change uh, impacts them in a really real way, and the things that they can do that make them feel like they're not so small. Um, and the three tactics that we saw fellows using to to bring this this strategy to life. Um, the first was building understanding. And so there is an element of the technical here. So um, it's not just about the personal, it is about um, what are the pieces of information? What are the, what are the parts of this problem that people need to be able to understand to be able to be effective in this? And that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody needs to become an expert in greenhouse gas emissions, inventories, or um, you know, complex uh, climate science. Uh, but it doesn't mean that, that people need to, to feel a level of um, confidence in, in, in some of the complexity and feel like it's not just a problem for, for technical experts to solve. Yeah, and um, that is second... also what, what we do in Low Carbon City, educating and sharing people the information to mobilize the 
climate action that is fair with with people with the planet so yeah that's why we are here for you and me <laughs> you don't have to be experts we we do it <laughs> Exactly. I mean, and that's not a coincidence, right? Low Carbon City is one of the uh, the organisations that we researched uh, mm -hmm. when we were putting this together. So um, there, I, I hope that you will see uh, a lot of the tactics that, that we talk about uh, are ones that you guys do, because you're a brilliant example of this coming to life. Um, the second one, that, the second tactic here is around making progress visible. So this is, again, to counteract the sense that that one person is too small. How do you show that the progress is happening? Because, you know, there there are well, well, there's still a long way to go. The rate of um, emissions is slowing, and there is there is a possibility that we might actually peak emissions in the next year or so. Um, but that's big and abstract. So how do you then break it down into a thing that feels tangible for somebody? So you're not only making progress visible at a global scale, but but at a way that, that they can relate to. And then the third tactic here is around imagining new possibilities. You know, if, any, if anybody says that they have a clear um, idea of, of what solving climate change looks like, um, I would be very sceptical because ultimately nobody knows what what the future is going to look like because we're building something that's never come before but if we can't imagine it then we definitely can't build it and so how do you help people activate their imagination so that it feels like like change is possible so moving on to the second strategy if you think about that first one as being about the individual this one is about that individual in relation to others or about the the social um and so what we what we saw here is you know recognizing that climate action um, or really creating change in any sense is is hard um, doing it alone is even harder so how do you bring um, support around a person so that they don't feel so alone so either um, if we, and we look if we look at the tactics here either like walking alongside them either one-to-one -one mentoring coaching support um, rolling up your sleeves and, and really getting down into the into the challenge with them or creating a community around them a community of peers where um, it's sort of there's there's a sense of learning together there's a sense of shifting the social norms so that the people do act and and feel like action is the is the new norm um, and also just you know not not feeling like they're the only ones who are having to provide this sort of sustained energy into this change um, and then the third tactic that we saw here was was helping make the case. And so that was about helping people navigate, because in, in almost every instance of trying to take action on climate change, we, we're needing to to convince other people that it's needed, that our solution is 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 going to be positive. And so working with people to make the case to others who either are power holders or can unlock other support and resources, um, or who might be barriers to change. And then this third strategy, creating enabling conditions. Um, this was the, the broadest of the three strategies that we looked at. And if we think about the first one as being the individual and the second one as being the, the social and the relational, um, this, this third strategy is about the context that, that you're operating in or the people that you're trying to activate or operating in. And we saw three things here, um, but again, there are lots of different ways of doing it. But the three tactics that we saw were building new structures, creating accountability mechanisms and addressing competing demands. And if we think about um, building new structures, you know, sometimes we're the, the solution that we're trying to bring to life um, as, as change makers, um, you know, it's, it's we've, we've now got the internal motivation and we've got the support but but there's just a really practical barrier that needs to be removed and sometimes that removing that barrier actually looks like building something new um so that could be something like uh, um, a new financial mechanism a new fund uh, a new legal contract um or it could be a new organization uh Looking at the second tactic here, creating accountability mechanisms. This can be internal or um, or external. So it could be something as as big as the um, 
the UN's race to zero uh, was one of the, the case studies that we looked at here, or it could be as small as just um, public pledges that, that local businesses make. And then the third one here, um, addressing competing demands. This one is 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 probably the the most complex of the um, of the tactics to sort of to to try the, the it was the most complex to try and capture in the in the playbook because it is so broad. You know, competing demands are something that are just a reality in this work and, and I think we often um, are encouraged to shy away from from talking about the trade-offs that some um, solutions um, create uh, because we we know that that then triggers people's sense of loss um, but sometimes the the act of addressing those competing demands is simply talking about it and, and gaining um, uh, emotional closure uh, other times it's about actually resolving them. So, for example, um, you know, a really straightforward one would be in an instance where somebody has internal motivation and wants to take um, take action, wants to be um, protecting some uh, biodiversity uh, in their local community, but that they're struggling to meet their basic needs, uh, creating jobs that enable them to both meet their basic needs and also to be conserving nature, for example, is, is quite a straightforward way of doing this. Um, but it shows up in so many different ways. So that's the that's the framework. In the playbook itself, we've got um, a whole bunch of questions that people can work through so that they can think about which of those tactics are most relevant for their work. Because it's worth noting that while all of the fellows that we interviewed used tactics from each of those three strategies. Um, it's not that all of those nine tactics need to show up in every context. Um, quite often, it's a matter of prioritization and figuring out which of those tactics or which of those strategies needs most attention for the people that you're working with. Um, and so we've got questions in the playbook that help people guide to help guide people through those decisions. And in addition, we've got we've got five case studies of the social entrepreneurs that five of the social entrepreneurs that we um, that we interviewed, just to help um, bring the framework to life um, and show how it's implemented. And this is just a beautiful quote from from one of the one of the case studies, one of the Ashoka fellows, um, Nicole Rycroft, whose organisation Canopy um, works with some of the biggest brands around the world and gets them to. Um, transform their supply chain so that they're removing unsustainable forestry practices. And she says, um, by removing barriers, you're freeing people up to be climate change makers, to make decisions in their businesses that are better for planet and climate, creating the license to bring their values actively into their job and the core of their business model. We sweep the resistance away. And I just love this, this idea that, um, you know, if we think that people care already, how do we free them up to bring that care, to bring those values, to bring that desire to, to see these global problems um, have progress made? How do we give them permission or how do we help them find their own permission, even better, um, to bring that care into their jobs? I'm going to stop sharing my screen. That is awesome like we can all use these tactics differently in our organizations and uh, you can download the the playbook in the ashoka network uh, in the web page is in english uh, we can also we have a spanish version oh uh, you, you yeah. release it in spanish great <laughs> um and and hopefully portuguese will be on the way in the not too distant future wow um, great and it's, yeah. it's already uh, available or you can also send it I, to us and we can i will have to share send it. it to you i got yeah. told after the fact that it had been translated by somebody um which is uh, awesome um yeah. but yes but that means i'll have to send it to you great news that is really good so we can make this information more available to everyone uh, especially in other regions of the world uh, that are facing the, the impacts of climate change 
and I wanted to to ask you. You talk in the in the playbook about the need to shake the inertia in the system. Yeah. So what are the changes that we have to address for that we have to keep in mind and how we as regular citizens can shake the inertia in the in the system why we need more change makers in climate action and what are those main goals that we have to keep in mind as society yeah i love this question and i love that you um that you frame it as as citizens um because I think that's that's kind of key. And as I, as I said earlier, like we often get um, told about our consumer decisions rather than our citizen decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and we are so much more powerful when we think of ourselves as citizens. Um, maybe on that part of the question around shaking the inertia, um, I kind of, and I, and, maybe this will resonate with with some of your some of your network um but you know we we often it's it's often easy to think that the reason why we're not seeing action on climate change is because people don't care mm. and that it's um you know the inertia is coming from apathy um but there is brilliant research and and multiple different places where you can can see this this idea that that people are apathetic that they don't care that that's been disproven you know people care we we have research that shows that there's a brilliant piece of research um that i recommend people check out by um yale university's climate communication center um and i can share a link um yeah. but they did a, a global survey a couple of years ago i think in 2022 um 110 countries and tens of thousands of people around the world and they looked at public um, attitudes um, their knowledge about climate change policy preference behaviors all, all around climate um, and one of the things that they did as part of this was they categorized people into six different categories about with essentially how they felt about climate change and it was on a spectrum and it went from alarmed at one end through concerned da, 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 all the way through to um dismissive at the other end so it was six categories and uh, around the world the category that like the the majority of people across all of the countries are in those top two categories alarmed and concerned and if i look at um south and central america um the majority of people in every country except for one Haiti are in those top two categories. Um, so in Mexico, for example, 64% are alarmed, so that top category, and 24% are concerned. In Chile, it's 65% alarmed and 18% concerned. In Colombia, it's 60% alarmed and 19% concerned. And so, you, so we can see that the inertia that we see in the system isn't coming from apathy. So where is it coming from? And in part, it's coming from the fact that fossil fuel usage, which is one of the biggest causes of climate change um, and land use change are so tied up in our economic systems and our political systems, um, you know, in the ways that we, that we live as a society, that, um, that untangling those usages, that the causes of climate change requires such a big shift that we need stuff to be happening everywhere all at once and so we come back to that premise in the that, that we sort of started out with of everyone everywhere all at once yeah so we we have to make that jump into more action and just pass that point where we are alarmed and concerned that we are actually trying to implement solutions trying to join an organization from your jobs from the local government and mm -hmm. the, the office the major's office what can we be doing what meetings can can we have to actually start taking action in, in not just worrying about the the news 
and yeah the the reality that we are facing today so that is one one call that we have because it's very important to know that one we are not alone uh in this is many people that care but yeah we have to join and actually um try to make the changes happen and and make them possible and what recommendations can you give us when we are trying to work with uh, local governments with uh, politicians that are not very uh, they don't have political will they say they they care but in reality they don't make the the decisions aligned with the with the climate science uh, what is your recommendation to work in scenarios where changes are not happening uh, at the speed that we need. Yeah, so um, maybe for context, I uh, I worked in local government here in in Wellington, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, for a couple of years, and um, uh, I just want to acknowledge the fact that uh, you know I know that that's sort of given the city's element of what you do that that a lot of people um, in your network are probably working in that space or in trying to influence that space, and it's hard right? Like all of this lovely stuff about, oh, you just need to make it personal and build support and da, da, da. Like it's hard. Like I don't want to um, sugarcoat it. And particularly when you're coming up against um, situations where there's low political will, um, it, like, it can feel like you're just wasting your time. Um, I, I, in in thinking about like what a practical thing is though to to be recommending, I guess there's a couple of things that come to mind. One is um, so Christiana Figueres, who I who I spoke about before, um, who does the forward for the playbook. Um, you know, I've heard her talk about um, when she's been in uh, you know conversations or even negotiations with people who aren't climate change people. And, uh, you know, I, I remember her saying that, you know, she can go through the whole conversation and not mention climate change once, but to know the other levers that are reasons for implementing certain solutions. Mm -hmm. So focusing on the solution itself. So, for example, if we think like with the city's lens, if we're talking about, you um, uh, active transport, you know, increasing cycling and walking um, mm -hmm. and and mass transport. Um, you know, there's one of one of my brilliant colleagues at, at Wellington City Council um, uh, really was 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 adamant that we always talked about those things as moving more people with fewer cars. And so it wasn't about climate change and emissions reductions. There was no like values judgment on it. It was just we're going to have more people in the city. If we have more cars, it's going to be harder to move around. So we need to move more people, more people with fewer cars. And so it's kind of like sometimes the thing that you need to do is, you know, climate action by stealth, um, and and getting the solutions in on 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 merits that don't have to do with with reducing emissions. The caveat here is that it's risky, right? Because sometimes if something gets pushed through without a deep commitment to climate change, that those climate change gains can be eroded or or they risk being um, uh, lost uh, mm -hmm. at a later date if it if it doesn't come through with with that that deep level of commitment. But yeah, that's that's probably the thing that that comes to mind yeah we have to show the all the benefits that climate action has in and also understand the economic per perspective and the social perspective of climate action because it's not just about taking taking care of the environment is is about everything it's about taking care of life of people of our homes and um, of our future so yeah we have to make people see that and, and think about the future, not just in, in one or two years uh, that we can be uh, with business as usual, but we have to think in 10, 20, 30 years um, and think, wait, 
what what is the world that we want to live in and what are the changes that we have to make to make that possible so yeah there are many many uh, benefits of climate action that we can uh, share and and also we we launched last year uh, also um a book i can i can share with you it's in, it's in spanish but it's called the fair climate action guide with mm. with some recommendations for um people in in local governments to implement projects in the um, in the political uh, local uh, plans so yeah we talk about social health uh, we talk about mobility so yeah you have to show the the great picture to to people and i went i wanted to ask you before yeah. you do, can i can i build on that for a second because i think yeah, one sure. of the risks um or one of the things that's really hard about that and there's a um there's a brilliant body of work that i recommend um people check out um that talks about this but essentially some of the solutions that we're talking about solve multiple problems at the same time right like mm -hmm. that's why we've got all of these multiple benefits that come off Mm -hmm. And there's a body of work around this this idea of multi-solving, so solving multiple problems at the same time, um, uh, that's been put together by a group called the, the Multi-Solving Institute, headed up by um, Dr. Elizabeth Sarwin, who I just, I, I, their work is brilliant. Um, one of the challenges that comes from, from these types of solutions is that the benefits don't accrue to a single department or a single entity within our systems yeah. enough. And so none of them feels motivated to make the investment because they're like, well, and, and you know, I think of, think of homes, like insulating homes. Insulating homes has some cl climate benefits, right? Mm -hmm. It reduces the and amount of energy that we need to be able to heat homes to a, a healthier standard. But it's but it's limited in terms of a climate solution because people also warm their houses more still, right? Like it's not like it it's a one for one. So you then have to bring in the health benefits. But it's not enough of a health benefit for it to be, and it doesn't it just doesn't fit neatly within the medical sector. And so mm -hmm. the climate team and the medical and the like anybody who's involved in healthcare can't quite make the justification. And it's too expensive for homeowners who who really need it. And so it's sort of the benefits across all of them but then it's really hard to coordinate so that that benefit that the holistic benefit is recognized enough to get the investment and so it's that's then a challenge and I've, I've found that sometimes just naming that can can help shift the inertia make people go oh of course of course that's what's happening oh that's silly of course we need to do this anyway mm -hmm. um but not always, right? Like it's it can be really hard. Anyway, yeah. sorry, you were going to ask a question, but I I got excited about no, but that. That's a great tip because we also have to call a more multi-sectoral action in in climate change, and yeah, just if one um, actor another actor can join to finance the solution, it makes all the sense in the world. But getting there is is a is a walk that we have mm. to take is is yeah is a long shot but we have to aim for that so mm -hmm. thanks thanks for for sharing that with us because it's very important and i wanted to ask you uh what are some projects or innovations solutions that you got to see during your research that can give back hope to many people that still think that the solutions are far away or that we uh, we have no opportunities to actually um do climate action so yeah what can you share some of the experience and just examples that give you hope for the future um so i saw so many so many like the ashoka fellows themselves like if anybody um is looking for inspiration like check out the local ashoka fellows for whatever country you're in they're like hands down brilliant humans with brilliant work um 
Uh, but there's also there's so many examples that are coming from within local government, from within business. Like there's there's just there is stuff happening everywhere, and I think it's it's often um, we a lot of it goes unrec under recognized and under celebrated. Um, so one one specific example that I'm going to share because I think well not only is it like I just love it. Also, I think it's probably the one from our research that is most relevant for um, for this particular group. Um, and that's an organisation called Civic Square in Birmingham. And they are, um, they, they talk about their work as being uh, putting a neighbourhood at the forefront of its own social, economic and climate transition. And they are both bold and really, really thinking deeply about what, what needs to come next. And they are also doing this work with such integrity and such, um, such thoroughness and inclusion um, within the community that they're working in, um, that it's just, uh, yeah, I, I, I find their work hugely inspiring. But they've done things. Um, so, so first of all, one of the ways that they that they think about their work is 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 really just showing up, rain, hail, shine, being there in the community to start to um, to sort of coalesce people around this idea of 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 what needs to come next in in the community. Um, being a trusted voice, really, really building trust, like embedding themselves in place. Um, the the types of experiments that they've done are really, I think, can be um, the like I say, the thoroughness with which they're thinking these things through mean that that their work can be a demonstration of what's possible elsewhere at scale. So, if there were, for example, a city. Um, or municipality that that wanted to learn from them, they could kind of pick up these solutions and embed them at that at that city scale. So, so Civic Square is really trying to do the work, so that so that these ideas can be proven and then mainstreamed. Um, but one of the things that they've done is around community level retrofits. And so, what does it take to you know we, we come back to that idea of you know of of, of houses um, and 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 how we um, have warm healthy homes mm -hmm. and you know in the uk retrofitting houses and and you know um removing gas doing insulation those types of things if you do it house by house it is just not going to happen fast enough and so how do you rethink that how do you do that faster well you can do it at the level of the street or at the level of the neighborhood but that's that's not how we normally operate so thinking back to the to the framework you know, one of the things that's needed to make that happen is different types of, of financing mechanisms, different types of legal contracts. But you also need to build, bring people together so that they all see the benefit in doing this at the same time, because it's not just the buildings, it's also, you know, the humans in those buildings that need to be brought along for the journey. Um, and they've done some brilliant work around this and they've got great resources on their website that people can check out. Um, but yeah, anyway, I could I could talk about them for for a long while, but that's that's one that I would I would recommend people really check out. Great, you can send us the link, and in, in you we can just put it in the description of this Amazing. recording, so we can all have access to that initiative. Because yeah, we sometimes need inspiration, and it's very helpful to to do that to search. Yeah, where is someone else doing in other parts of the world how can we come together and join join forces uh, to do the climate action possible and i also wanted to ask you what we were talking about the importance of also you you said also touching people's heart yeah not not only the the rational part of our brain but also yeah what what is that we care about? What are our motivations? Uh, but when we talk about climate change, you said it yourself is sometimes it's hard to look at the reality, the numbers, the predictions, 
Uh, so what is your advice on yeah, just dealing with the information and also when you care so much about the planet, the people, the biodiversity, what are the strategies that you use or that you, you've seen other organizations, other social entrepreneurs use to not br bringing themselves down or being just yeah concerned, but actually um, being motivated and being excited about the future. Yeah, I think um, it's such a it's such an important thing to discuss. I mean, the times that I feel most um, uh, despondent about it all and overwhelmed um, is often when I'm not talking about it, right? Like when I, when I don't have people around me that I can talk to about it. Um, and so for me, one of my, one of the, one of the things that's important to like keep me balanced is, um, is to have a group of peers that I can, that I can talk about it with um, because it's, it's hard, right? And I think that's, you know, it, it comes back to the idea of like, you know, those, those alarming headlines, that slide that I had with all of those alarming headlines, when we feel this sense of, um, of alarm and uh, like fear, um, it's a valid emotion. And to, if we try and switch that off or squash it, then it will come out in other ways. It will come out in like, being burnt out in our work it'll come out in you know um yeah just kind of uh <laughs> being sickness. super aggressive sickness yeah like I, I also know that like sometimes the um the fear that I feel or, and, and the anger that I fear feel about um about what's being done turns up as like essentially like fighting you know, and that's that fight sometimes gives me energy and motivation, but it's it's not a sustainable thing. And so for me, I've I've um, I've I've really had to think about what it what it means for me to come to bring to for my work to come from a place of care rather than a place of like fear and fighting. Um, and it, like I I don't by any means uh, get it right all the time. Uh, but at the moment, like I'm investing in giving myself space to to make that happen. Yeah, very important to also take care of ourselves so we can take care of the planet, the earth, our our families. So okay. yeah, that's yeah, exactly. Important advice, especially I think for young generations, that sometimes we feel like we have to save the world, we have to do these huge uh transformations but is is really not about you doing everything but everyone doing their part and building agency as, as you said it in the in the playbook how can we all do our part and we can really transform this this system together yeah. so yeah that's that's really good and i wanted to ask you uh how do you see latin america in terms of climate action in terms of our challenges especially um yeah we are very vulnerable to to the climate impacts our economies depend a lot on fossil fuels and yeah just the the transitions are something that cause many discussions around here um so yeah how do you see the region the region in terms of our challenges but also the solutions that are thriving from this this region yeah i mean it's obviously a hugely diverse region right both like do from a ge ge geography perspective but also like a socio-political perspective um but i think it's also hugely globally important on both of those fronts right like um yeah and i i think you know if i if i think about um what's coming up. Like I, I, I think I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about the fact that Brazil is going to be hosting COP30. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that you know, I think that's an opportunity to, to really bring um, economic justice into the center of the conversation. 
um, particularly given if we think about the places that have hosted the last few um, global negotiations. I think like I'm, I, I know I'm not alone in being excited about the the fact that the next one's going to be um, hosted by Brazil. I also think that there's, um, you know, if, if I think about some of the climate leaders, um, like a lot of the ones that I think are doing some really radical work are coming from your region, right? Like there's great Indigenous le leadership that's um, becoming globally more prominent and I can only hope that that's going to mm -hmm. like have an opportunity to to be platformed even more during COP30, um, like to formally do that. Um, but there's also, uh, you know, I, there are amazing um, like community-led grassroots solutions coming out from outside of, of Indigenous leadership. Um, you know, water and renewables, um, in regenerative practices. Um, there's one of the Ashoka Fellows who I think of um, quite a lot, uh, a, a man by the name of uh, Tasso Azevedo um, and his organisation uh, Map Biomass, um, and they're working on deforestation. Um, uh, the way that they're doing that is through open data and so they've got i think it's 30 odd years of 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 data across this sort of multi-actor platform um on land use for brazil and the and the wider region um as well as the impact of mining and fire and and other things as well but it's um you know it's not data for data's sake it's data um as a as a tool for empowering multiple diverse actors you know people in in business people in government mm -hmm. people in the local communities um and a way of like creating accountability and transparency um for what's going on and i think that 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 type of approach was really groundbreaking you know they've been doing this for years and uh, i think it's it's then informed other approaches around the world right like it's um you know, and, to, and to think that that, that, that innovation um, came from that in America, I think is is something that's um, you know that's that's another like if I think about what's happening in in your region, that's that's what I think about. Great, yeah, we have to use data for taking the the best decision possible for for our futures. And I also wanted to 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 know how do you feel about the future when you think about the future and yeah your job what we can achieve as a society how do you feel what are your perspectives yeah um look, i think that there are changes ahead of us that are beyond any of our imagination um you know the the impacts of the ecological crisis are already being felt um and will only get more severe um you know, if I think about our cities, um, they're being built for climates that no longer exist, right? The assumptions that we base our our infrastructure on, uh, the assumptions that we base our whole society and economy on, you know, they're, they're already obsolete because of the impacts of climate change now, not even the future, right? So I think we've got... Um, a period of great discomfort as we, um, as as those things become more and more obvious and and need to be addressed, um, and I think that people are realizing that increasingly. Um, uh, but that's but it will still be at best uncomfortable. At the same time. Um, you know, our, our collective ingenuity is a powerful tool. There is incredible work that's happening all around the world. There are pockets of resistance to powerful forces. Um, there are green shoots of possibility that are showing up um, in our cities, in our communities, that show alternative ways of, of building our societies. And, um, you know, and, and as I keep saying, there, there are people everywhere who care deeply. And, you know, I, I think all of those things mean that it's, the change is happening and will continue to happen and will continue to accelerate. 
Um, you know, I think that there's a, a whole a whole lot of stuff written at the moment about hope and optimism and um and I think if I if I had to to weigh in on that front, I'm 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 hopeful. Um I don't believe that we've got, you know, like a, a finite window to avoid annihilation of, of humanity. Um but at the same time I you know I'm aware of the of the difficulties that are ahead of us. And I, based on that, I, I think that we've got the power and the responsibility to to shape the best version of what comes next. And I think if I, you know, if I really dig into to what that means for me, it's it's not just about avoiding climate change. It's that we also build a world that is more just, mm -hmm. uh, that is more um, sustainable, but that it's also more connected and more joyous. And I think that's possible. Yeah, we have to use our own power as citizens, whether we are in school, university, or at homes, or our jobs, to make that changes possible as soon as we can, so so we don't get too uncomfortable. <laughs> hopefully, so yeah, we yeah. all have we all have that power. Uh, and what would be an advice or a, a final note that you can give us? Uh, for example, someone that wants to start an organization or someone that wants to start a social entrepreneurship uh, and working on climate change, but they are maybe they are not very uh, secure about if their solution are going to, to work or if they are going to get the impact that they want or if they need people to join their their initiative but they feel like no no one is going to to believe in this no one is going to join me and uh, what would be your advice and how can we just uh shake that that fears and start by taking action yeah um uh that's a great question um my advice would be to to start small to not be attached to your idea um but to uh be committed to the problem you're trying to solve because if one of the things that that um that you're afraid about is that it won't work or that it won't have the impact it's like as long as you're committed to that impact rather than committed to this particular version of the solution then i think you can't fail because if you if you try your particular solution and it doesn't quite work mm -hmm. then you take what you've learned and you apply it to having impact later on there's a um there's a quote that uh, a friend of mine says um which is fall in love with the problem not the solution mm -hmm. and i think that's uh that's a wonderful piece of advice yeah that's that's great thanks peep so much for for this talk for this space and sharing the the work with with us um we can all learn more about the climate change maker playbook uh it's very good news that we can have it also available in spanish so we can we can share it with many people and yeah what what are you doing right now what are you researching for at the at the moment well the thing i'm researching is um uh it's less research and it's more um uh, practice so uh i want to work with a couple of organizations to see how they can use the playbook so uh, i actually will have a couple of slots available so if one of the organizations in your network would like somebody to walk alongside them as they try and activate other people, I would be more than happy to spend some time, have some calls and um, yeah, just think with them about uh, what they're trying to achieve, who they're working with and um, yeah, share lessons that I've seen working with with other people all around the world. So Great. yeah, that's, that's an offer to put out there. And where they can reach you, write you, learn more about your job and what you are uh, doing right now. I will put an email address in the in the show notes.
Okay, great. Do you want to add something else to to finish our our conversation? No, just um, just uh, to say thank you and to to just reiterate the fact that I have found your work, the work of Low Carbon City, um, hugely inspiring over the years uh, from my first mm -hmm. conversations with uh, with you guys, with Juliana, um, through to through to now. Like I think the work you're doing is brilliant. Um, and so thank you. And, and yeah, I just, I'm excited that, that there's this brilliant network of peers who are learning from each other and who are, yeah, making our cities, uh, all of those things I was just talking about, more connected, more just, more joyous, more sustainable. Thanks, Pip. Yeah, I, I wanted to also share with you that we are doing some small research here in, in Medellin with um, university students about eco-anxiety, which, which is mm -hmm. also something that we are seeing more in young people, uh, just this uh, anxiety, desperation, uh, depression that some people feel when thinking about climate, um, climate change. And we also want to give some tools and uh, just um, ideas to get to a point where we are not just concerned, alarmed, but we are actually are taking actions, are building organizations, uh, companies that solve these problems. And we are going to use your book because it's very inspiring. Yeah, it's um, give us many tools that we want people to take uh, into their jobs. And we want people also to commit with climate action. So yeah, we are going to share the the results with you as well when we get to that point probably at the end of the year and we are going to be presented presented it in the low carbon city world forum that is going to be here in colombia so yeah i wanted to thank you uh, thank you for this um, amazing job uh, just doing the the playbook with your co-authors um and sharing all of their experience with organizations like us and many people that uh, also want to be doing more in their in their context in their countries so thank you so much Pip, for your for your job and your time to share with us oh my absolute pleasure thank you so much thanks